So thank you so much for joining us. Kelsey's here today, not only the author of this book, but the founder of Help Each Other Out, her organization. And she is a she works at UC Berkeley as well as uh, Cal State University, and has been featured on NPR and the Washington Post and a number of other media outlets. And we're lucky to have her today, and I appreciate you coming to join us. So we're going to hear a bit from Kelsey, and then we'll have some time for Q and A. I have a couple of questions teed up, but primarily we'll make space for your questions. There is a Dory in the calendar invite, so if you're watching live stream and you'd like to put a question in, or if you're watching live and you'd like to put a question in, please feel free and we'll make time for those. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon. It's really good to be here with you all. Uh, I live in San Francisco, Bernal Heights neighborhood, which is a bedroom community to Google. And it's actually been with the help of a lot of Googlers that help each other out got started, whether attending our launch event or donating to our Indiegogo campaign, participating in workshops. So to be here in your company, literally and figuratively, <laughs> is just a real treat. And um, Karen and I did connect when her mom was dying and since then, and we have a friendship now. And I think that that speaks to the bounty of learning how to connect in times of vulnerability. When we might want to run away, there's some true benefits when we actually do connect. And um, that's what we're here to talk about. My talk will focus mostly on the notion of trust. That when being there with others in their time of suffering, how can we trust ourselves? Uh, and then Karen and I will be going into some Q&A with some practical tips, too, around communication, because we all want to stay out of the doghouse. <laughs> so I don't know how many of you here know somebody who might have asked you, why in the heck would you take some time out of your day to hear a talk about suffering? Because I doubt you're a masochist. I do suspect, however, that you may have had some brush with suffering enough to know that what we're really here to talk about is meaning. Meaning comes from work and relationships, and the relationships that matter in our lives, the ones that sustain us through the emotional ups and downs, the depression, the breakups, the professional screw-ups, the losses. These relationships are ones we don't make them when we're on top of the world. We forge them when we're at our bottom. And I hate to tell you this, guys, but when you hit your 40s, oh my god, everybody's hitting some kind of bottom. And then the bottom is falling out from under the bottom. So I'm glad you're getting started on this young. <laughs> I found it help each other out to make it easier for us to build these relationships. Because as important as they are, it can be kind of hard to do. So we offer empathy boot camp workshops, which I developed with the help of people in medicine and in business and in therapy. And we also do public art exhibits on being there, which are these neighborhood-wide installations that we've done in several San Francisco neighborhoods and in New York that feature kind gestures that got people through a difficult time. And then there is the book, There is No Good Card for This, that I wrote with Emily McDowell, who's a wonderful writer and illustrator. And that book is based on a lot of research that I did in this area. This is a lot of work to do, to figure out if I should leave my bereaved colleague a donut on their desk. Why do I do it? And I have two answers to that. The first is because I'm actually not by nature very good at this. There are some people who just seem really comfortable being around people's pain, having emotionally vulnerable conversations. That wasn't me. I am a Sagittarius from Brooklyn. <laughs> Anybody who knows our species knows we are not the most empathic creatures on the planet. We're far more quick to tell you what we think about something than we are to listen to somebody else's perspective. And that can make for a really lively dinner conversation. It could make for a really engaging team meeting. But it really doesn't work when you're trying to connect to somebody who's feeling emotionally vulnerable. 
Time and time and time again, I would let down my friends who were going through something hard, a loss, a miscarriage, a breakup. I was that person that would shy away, not because I didn't care, but because like so many of us, when you don't know what to do or say, you might say nothing at all. I reached a wall with this behavior when a friend from graduate school was diagnosed with breast cancer. I don't know why I reached that wall then, but I did. And I recognized that my reticence was not a gift to her. I wasn't sparing her my awkwardness. I was just being a coward. I wanted to be more responsible. I wanted to align my caring intentions with my actions. But I did not know how. I never did reach out to my friend, but I did do what any good social science researcher would do. I researched the problem. I developed an online survey of open-ended questions that basically asked what worked and what didn't to get you through your difficult time. That got legs, I got 900 responses, supplemented that with a bunch of interviews, and that's the basis of this book. But still, it's a lot to do, right? To just figure out how to be there in times of suffering. Why did it matter to me so much? Because I am sure, if I were to ask for hands, every one of you have had that moment of regret for saying something that just landed wrong or for not saying anything at all. But you move on. I couldn't move on. And that leads to the second deeper reason that I started this work. You see, my failure to connect with people in their times of vulnerability was not because I didn't know suffering. I wasn't green to grief. I did know suffering. It didn't uh, equip me to know what to do, but it did teach me that it matters. So my story around that is this. I grew up knowing only my mom. I didn't know my dad. I had no aunts, no uncles. My grandparents had passed away a long time ago. It was just she and I, and we were really, really close. She also had schizophrenia. And she managed that illness until she no longer could. When I was 19, she stopped taking her psychotropic medication. When I was 23, her paranoia got so consuming that she changed her number, changed the locks, and put out a restraining order on me. There were some very humiliating attempts to try to connect with her again, but I never did. And she did pass away. That loss, that loss of the mind has no ritual for mourning. At that young age, people weren't thinking about what to do. They were focused on their careers and their friends. Save for a handful of people, the loss of my small but entire family went unmentioned. In response to that, of course, I had some needs to belong. And they would really creep up at the time of the holidays. Where was I going to eat? When I had an overnight stay in the hospital, who was I going to pick up? Who was going to pick me up the next day? When I went to the Peace Corps for three years in Africa, where was I going home to? Did I ever express these needs? No. Because far more keenly than that desire to belong was feeling shame for having any needs at all. And I know I'm not alone in this. In my workshops, I ask people, what's hard about asking for help? Responses they give me verbatim are like these. Fear of being a burden. Feeling like I should be able to tolerate the situation. Fear that I will be seen only for my affliction and not as me. And the kicker, always throughout, shame. 
It's this person, this person who's at the bottom of their well. Maybe we reach out and offer them a self-help book, if we reach out at all. Maybe we ask them, let me know if there's anything I can do. I can guarantee you, most times they won't. And that self-help book, how you can manage adversity, F you. <laughs> <laughs> what if we flip the script? What if instead of buying a book for that person, we bought something like my book? <laughs> a book about how we can connect to others in their time of pain. What if, in the ways that we prioritize our goals and our practices to cultivate our emotional health and our own physical health, what if we applied that to our relational health? How much saner would our world be? How much more meaningful would our lives become? People who experience pain very often experience a second kind of pain, of isolation, of shame. They're surrounded by care, and they don't even know it. I didn't want to be a part of that problem anymore. That is the second deeper reason why I started Help Each Other Out. But even if we know that it's really, really important to connect in times of difficulty, it can be super hard to do, right? I identify three empathy roadblocks. One is fear of saying or doing the wrong thing, right? We don't want to make the situation worse. Second, the time, the emotional bandwidth. Our lives are crazy. Our own lives could be falling apart. It's so hard to see how you can fit in somebody else's needs into your schedule, right? And sometimes it can seem that when you acknowledge somebody's needs, you've opened up a Pandora's box of problems that you then become responsible for till the end of time. And then the third reason that we may not reach out is because we don't want to pry, right? We don't want someone to feel like they're a source of gossip. We don't want to make them uncomfortable. I have some really good news. These fears are totally normal. The even better news is that they're making it way too complicated. And I learned this from my daughter, Georgia. She was five at the time that she asked me from the back seat of our car, I'm driving over the Bay Bridge, Ma, uh, what do you do for a living? <laughs> well, I said, I try to help friends be there for each other when they're sad. Oh, she said, that's easy. <laughs> so she should not be in charge of promotion for this book. <laughs> it is, I said. Well, what would you say to help a friend? And she actually came up with a pretty good list. And I'm going to share it with you. You gave some ideas of what friends can do for each other when they're sad. Friends can say I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Do you want to play with me? Want to sit down with me? Mm -hmm. Also, um, do you want to take a break? Do you want to have a little hug? I'm seeing some head nodding. <laughs> it works, right? It's not a bad list. So we're done. I think I can go home now. <laughs> Beat the traffic. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? But the saying goes, simple is not always easy. Something happens between then, her age and now. We enter into more domains where we expect competence, productivity, fixing things. We've made mistakes, learned not to trust ourselves. By the time we're adults, we become so self-conscious about how to just be there with somebody we care about. We imagine that there is some Herculean gesture, some phrase 
that could heal this person's situation. It's just eluding me right now, but when it comes to me, that's when I'll offer it up. But the real news is, there is no perfect thing you can say, there is no perfect thing that you can do to fix someone's situation. And honestly, that perfect person, when your life is falling apart, is the last person you want to see. Right? So let's unpack it a bit. You know, what is behind connecting in times of suffering? What does it actually take? In my workshops, I have what are called gesture cards. They ask prompts, they provide prompts that ask people, what got you through? And what got you through, you know, with a colleague or a neighbor or a best friend or a family member? And I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these. So I'm gonna share some with you. And it's a highly representative sample of what I see. What colleagues did that touched me. I had a miscarriage and my colleagues sent me a beautiful bouquet of flowers with a lovely heartfelt message attached. A friend I hadn't heard from in years emailed, called to say I'm sorry. Take note guys, my son came by and did all the dishes and laundry. listened to me, brought me and my family meals every night for over a month, strangers. My sister came to my house after a terrible breakup and made me something to eat. She doesn't normally come over. It meant a lot. Donated clothes when we couldn't go home after 9-11. This was in New York City. How many of these gestures require a significant grasp of human psychology? How many of them take a lot of time? What's really amazing, and this surprised the heck out of me, is you don't even need to have an intimate knowledge of a person's situation or have a strong relationship with them. A couple of things that I learn from these gesture cards and from my data. First, if you care, your care belongs. So remember, when I started this work, I had a kind of matrix where you had the gesture and the relationship. And I imagined that there was the appropriate gesture for the appropriate relationship. And I was gonna unlock this science. <laughs> well, that was completely foolhardy. Gestures from colleagues and neighbors can be just as meaningful and can look very much like the gesture that you get from a friend or a family member. They can mean even more when you don't have gestures coming from friends or family members. So if you care, your care belongs. Second thing that I noticed about the data and about these gesture cards, people don't describe appreciation for favors. They don't say, I asked my brother to pick me up to go to chemo, and he did. A favor comes with some amount of indebtedness, obligation, right? We don't feel totally thankful for that. We are thankful for unexpected offers. So that leads to the second thing I noticed about this data, which is reach out and do not wait to be asked. Let's say you're ready to reach out, right? Okay, you guys, you're ready. What do I do? If they don't tell me what they need, how do I know how to respond? I get this concern. I would say the answer in that lies in trust to trust yourself. And I have two tips for that. The first is to trust what you know how to do. In fact, what you like to do. So for example, if you, um, I learned this the hard way actually, 
as I learned too many things. I learned at some point that people cook, right, for somebody who's in a difficult time. Maybe they're bereaved, they've just had a baby, they're sick. Some people make dishes and they bring those over. Okay, that's what I'll do. Except I hate to cook. So when I would cook, it would be with a lot of stress. I'm like putting out an all boiling all boiling bulletin. I'm cooking, you know. Handle me with kick gloves. I'm stressed, uh, and I would go through all of this work. I would often arrive late and offer this dish with a ton of caveats about why it tasted so bad. <laughs> Nobody wants that dish. If, however, you do like to cook. Do not worry about the other 20 casseroles that are in the refrigerator, because chances are 80% of them are from people like me. <laughs> if you like to listen, trust that just by asking, how are you today, and really wanting to know, that that is a very meaningful gesture. Trust that if you like getting donuts and you know your colleague's favorite food, Bring them their favorite donut. Trust what you know how to do, what you like to do, and just offer it. The second tip for building trust, trust that is that bridge between your intention and your action, right? The second tip is to trust what you know uh, and trust what you know deeply. It can be very, very intimidating when somebody's going through an experience that you haven't gone through before. You may know somebody, for example, who's had a very significant loss or a divorce, and you, you've never been through that, so you doubt that you have the capacity to connect with them over this situation. But the reality is no one has shared the exact same experience with somebody else down to the molecular level. And the other truth is, underlying suffering are just a few components that actually run across all kinds of experiences with pain. So for example, if you've never lost somebody very, very close to you, take a moment to look inside. You may know what it is to feel lonely and lost. You may have never lost a job. You may have never been fired. But take a moment to look inside. You may know what it is to have your confidence broken. You may not be a member of the Widows Club, but you are a member of the Frail and Messy Human Club. So in conclusion, I would say this. When it comes to connecting in times of difficulty, trust. Trust what you know how to do. Trust what you already know. You can be rest assured that even if your gesture or your phrase was not needed at that time that you offered it, that the meaning and human connection that kindness that compelled you to try, that most certainly was. Trust that. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we have time now. Kelsey said, I'm going to keep this short, so we'll answer the questions that are really top of mind for folks. Um, and so Jordan's going to share questions on the Dory. If you want to put a question into the Dory, whether you're sitting here or on live st stream, feel free. And we'll get to that. And we also have a mic that we'll hand around for live questions. Um, and while people are forming their questions, Kelsey, I, I wanted to go again to the practical tips. Yes. Yes. Um, because literally knowing what to do can be a barrier. And I know, I mean, I'm sort of embarrassed to say, even having read your book, I have two sympathy cards sitting in my bag that I should have sent weeks ago. And um, you know, 
sometimes it just gets hard. Mm -hmm. So some practical tips on how do we get ourselves to show up for the people who need us in the way that they need us to. Mm -hmm. Well, first, even a practical tip around those sympathy cards, which we all know that experience, right? Oh, I can't find the stamp. How do I get their physical address? There's no expiration date on condolences. So you said that it's way too late. This is where it is a gift to be a procrastinator. Because very often, that person who's grieving has heard a lot of condolences in the initial aftermath, and you know this. And then there are crickets. And you are actually still sitting with this pretty deeply, if not even more deeply, months later. And you don't even know if it's appropriate to bring up the fact that you're still grieving. So getting a card later in that process is a total gift. So you could just pretend that you meant it that way. <laughs> uh, or, of course, to send an email. Something that I do is put as a practical tip, I even if somebody's going through something, and even a, a positive thing, I put a little note in my calendar, just a little reminder. Don't forget to send the card that day. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, and you know, they keep toggling you until you do it. But there really is very rarely an expiration date on giving comfort. Great. Is that enough? Does Thank that help? You. Yes, we'll, we may come back I to I may a email few more. you to see if you sent those cards. Yeah. <laughs> Jordan, anything more? The uh, question I had. Um, uh, during the situation and what's going on in Houston right now mm -hmm. in Florida, have you seen some acts of kindness and gratitude that really have stood out in your mind? Yeah, I mean, well, I think everyone in Texas is talking about how disaster is bringing us back to humanity and the normal categories of political party or what have you are really just starting to disappear. So seeing people jump in and help providing their time, donating when you can, which is actually a huge source of help. Uh, it's, it's ongoing, yeah. I mean, even in my own community, people looking for housing for people uh, and lending a room. If you are at all amenable to hosting, for example, and you have an extra room and you're in the area, to just make that available, like it really, really counts. Uh, first story question, um, how much variety is there in how different people with different personalities benefit from different types of empathy? Yeah, no, that's a very analytical question. <laughs> and that's kind of where I started. <laughs> uh, and the key, the, what happens when you begin with that question is then you sort of get tripped up in making this the right gesture for the right person. And until you think that it's going to lay out the way you hope it's going to lay out, and until you figure that out, you don't do anything. So I would recommend stepping back and thinking, what do I actually like to do? So for example, I like to buy flowers. It's super cliche, but if I can get some me time and put together a bouquet, which I wouldn't do for myself, but I would very happily do that for somebody else, then that's what I'm going to do. And I no longer worry if this person wanted flowers or not. I just think about. I was able to give. And some of that then also is the flip side of giving, which is being able to receive. It's a pretty ungracious person who says, well, I don't like daisies. Why did they give me daisies? <laughs> so that's not on you, right? If you make a gesture that you know how to give, then just offer it up. If you like music, put together a playlist of your favorite songs. Maybe this person never expressed an interest in music. Knowing that you gave something that gives you joy is so much better to receive than receiving something that someone has a feeling caused you a lot of torture <laughs> to do. Um, that's really, really where I would start and not even worry too much about somebody else's personality type. Um, is there different advice to based upon the context, like compared to at work or in personal life? Because I, I know there's different barriers involved and whatnot. Yeah. It's such, I, when people come to my workshops, very often they're coming in with the question about how to support a colleague. 
they wind up leaving having the work infuse their entire social system because it impacts everything. But that question of what to do for a colleague is particularly vexing because we have certain boundaries around professional, right, private, public, and we want to honor those for reasons of being respectful and creating a healthy environment for accountability. <laughs> so there's a lot of reasons why we don't dive too deeply into somebody's personal life. That all said, increasingly, you know, over the generations, we are becoming more public. And I think this is such a good thing when we're going through something difficult. More and more, people are just aware that something is happening to your colleague. It's not a big secret. And so what winds up seeming like respectful distance when not doing something can actually feel very cold and callous. So I would recommend in the work context to still reach out if you care. This is really important. This is not to give you some to-do list or marching orders to start giving bouquets to every single person that crosses your path. But if there's a colleague that you care about, and you don't have to be that close, you can send an email, you can write a card. One woman, she talked about a colleague uh, who she wasn't that close with, and she had casually mentioned, tomorrow would have been my due date. And that colleague left her a bouquet of flowers on her desk the next day. So in the workplace, often there are gestures that you can do that don't require a lot of in-depth conversation, but that show I notice and I care. By the same token, if you actually do have a number of conversations, you complain about management together, <laughs> you talk about the sports or Project Runway or whatever, it's okay when you have a private moment or to even nab someone in the hallway and say, hey, I just want to check in. I just want to know how you're doing. How are you doing today? And that person would say, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. And you say, okay, I really, I just, I just want to know. I mean, just, I'm here if you want to tell me. And then that person may offer a more authentic response, or they may say, nope, I'm okay. They're likely not going to go home to their spouse and say, I can't believe that she asked me how I was doing. It was so obnoxious. What I can guarantee you is if nobody reaches out at the office, they're going to be going home talking about that. Um, when you started your talk about what, your, what you went through with your mother and everything, and you mentioned shame, mm -hmm. um, what were some strategies you used to neutralize the shame that you felt? You know, I'm not a good shame overcomer. <laughs> so I will, uh, if I write a book about resilience, it would be about how hard it is. <laughs> Um, I know the research behind shame says, you know, you just have to face your issue head on. And certainly by my doing this work, I have lost a lot of shame. And that comes from engaging deeply in the source of what I experienced, dialoguing with others, even people who I thought weren't there for me so much, having some of those difficult conversations. Um, that helped me to get over the shame. But now I have other kinds of shame. Um, another Dory question. Um, when I'm trying to support a friend, oftentimes one of the first things I do is ask, how can I help? Mm. When I started asking this, I was sure this would be helpful, but 90% of the time, the answer is something like nothing. Is there any better way you would recommend to discern their needs? Am I surprised? <laughs> <laughs> The best way to handle this situation, if you know that a friend is going through something difficult, just offer something. So for example, hey, I want to come by next Tuesday with pizza. My only question is, is it pepperoni or cheese? Right? You just offer it. Uh, make it very easy to accept by saying, I'm going to the store. I'm going to go get some things. Do you need anything? Or um, you love music, like I've said put together a playlist, just do it, just offer it. Maybe that person wasn't saying, God, I really, really hope somebody sends me a playlist today. That's not gonna happen. But they're gonna appreciate your offer, your kindness, that's backed by action, and they will be more receptive to asking you for help in the future. But just saying, how can I help, 
It's a very hard question for somebody who's suffering to, to hear and respond to for a few reasons. First, because of the shame. Second, you often don't quite know what you need when you're in a moment of crisis or grief. You can't say, you know, what I really need today is somebody to ask me, how am I? What I really need today is somebody, well, I do do this, to do my laundry. <laughs> <laughs> But very often, if you're in the initial aftermath of a crisis, so much around you is falling apart. The garden, the trash, the dishes, uh, keeping up with the bills, getting the kid to daycare, uh, let alone all the depression and the sadness. You, know, you could like name a thousand different things that you need and not find one for a response. So just offer up that, what you know how to do. Um. Now, do you think like the issues we have here in this country regarding like reaching out to people, asking if they need help, is due to a cultural aspect, or is there something else deeply rooted? Because I noticed that when I've gone to other like developing countries, like the cultural bonds seem to be much stronger, and people need to be m more open about their personal lives and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very true. Uh, I mean, Americans have just sort of like this history of pull yourself up by your bootstraps and sort of the individualism. Um, and it certainly, certainly is reflected in our inability to ask for help. Um, and I lived in Africa and I've also lived in South America and in Europe. And it is certainly true that we can be a lot more hesitant to offer help and also, frankly, to receive it. We're very, very likely here to say, oh, that's okay, I'm fine because we feel shame around receiving help. So there are differences. Uh, even, you know, just, and even around communication techniques, there can be some differences. You know, like the idea of giving advice. Uh, it's not really recommended <laughs> for people in a difficult time here who are American. Um, but advice giving can be seen a little bit differently in some different cultures. My question is around, um, is there sort of a not-do list? Um, did you ask that before I came in? No. <laughs> we've talked about it. I'm, I'm smiling because we've talked about the not-do list, and it's, it's also in the book. Um, awesome. So, yeah. great question. Yeah. And we all want that not-do list. <laughs> so uh, in, the, in the book, uh, Emily came up with a great, my co-author, she came up with a great title for it, which was, Please Help Me Not Be a Disaster. <laughs> so the not-do list, I have a couple of examples of those, but I'm just going to say what underlies pretty much every not-to-do is our tendency to fix someone's problem. And again, Karen would be the first to say, we don't pay people at Google to just sit around and be present. We are paying you to fix things, right? And we feel a lot of satisfaction when we can fix things. So our culture of productivity, problem solving, it's awesome. Not around these times of emotional vulnerability. Problem solving, fixing, it does it just shuts the whole thing down. Anybody have an experience with this? So an ex some examples of trying to fix someone's problem. Top on the list, giving advice. Someone tells you, I just can't, I just can't get over feeling so sad. Like I lost my dad two months ago and I'm still, I just think about him every day. The response, have you tried running, <laughs> is not helpful. Or, well, maybe if you thought about <laughs> not helpful, you know what you should do or what you could do? These are all signs that you're giving advice. Have you thought about, you know what you could do, you know what you should do? Instead, just say, I'm sorry, I imagine that's really hard, and be present. That's what's needed. So no fixing, no advice. And in the book, I also then talk about some non-listening styles, which are a lot of don'ts. And everyone in this room, including myself, including Karen, we all have our non-listening go-tos. It could, for example, be the eternal optimist. So uh, somebody who's always seeing the bright side of a situation, right? 
It can be from, oh God, I lost, you know, I ran out of gas on the bridge and I had to wait three hours for a toll truck. At least a toll truck came down to the deepest forms of suffering where somebody is told to see a silver lining. Gratitude, sure, it's very, very helpful for helping you cope. Finding meaning in tragedy, it's been scientifically proven, it helps us. But that meaning that we find, that gratitude that we experience, it can never be handed from outside. It only gets cultivated from within. So never try to offer somebody an optimistic perspective. I, as a non-listening style, am a doomsayer. Someone may say something really tragic, and I say, oh my god, that's horrible. And then they wind up responding to me, no, 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 it's not that bad. And they wound up not feeling like they can actually share what they're feeling, because then they feel they have to protect, deflect my alarm. So of course the doomsayer hates the optimist, and those two often marry each other, so pay attention. <laughs> Um, but so either reacting with strong alarm to somebody's situation or severe <laughs> positivity uh, can be really, really a don't, as well as giving advice. I have met several more examples, but it all comes down to trying to adjust how a person is viewing or handling their situation. And so often what winds up happening when you do that with any of those don'ts is you make that person feel more ashamed as if they should be having it together. Rarely is that our call to make. Under normal grieving circumstances, of course, there are times when somebody's hitting into a dangerous zone and that's different. Okay, uh, I have a follow-up question to that because I have a, <clears throat> I have a friend that I've been kind of supporting for years. Say that again, I'm sorry. I, I have a friend, and she's been having issues with her family for many, many years, and I've been there to kind of support her, listen to her, and this has been going on for maybe 10 years, and now I'm at the point where I really want to give advice. <laughs> I try to give advice, but now that she um, she's not interested in listening to the advice, but I can clearly see that some of the issues that she's having with her family is because of her actions and her response. It's yeah. really not the family that much. Yeah. And I discovered that, but it's, I, I, when I ta try to tell her that she might have a role in this, she just shuts me down. Yeah. So now I'm at the point, I don't know what to do anymore yeah. because I want to be there for her, I want to support her, but I also want her to realize that it takes two to tango. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. And I don't know how to move forward. Yeah, that's a real, real problem. Uh, and I talk about it in my book too. So there are problems sometimes that consume us so much and for so long. And the people around us who care about us don't even feel like they know who we are anymore. So as a friend who's seeing somebody consumed by their problem two, three, four years out, that's reached a whole other threshold of difficulty. And the way to begin that conversation is not with advice. Even though you see you know, so many other avenues this person could take, so many books they should read, so many like ways to handle this situation, it's so clear in front of you and she's not seeing it and you just wanna like, do a PowerPoint for her, <laughs> walk her through it. It's not gonna work as you know, right? The place to begin in that conversation is not with advice, it's where you are vulnerable. And that means talking about your relationship to her. You've lost your friend, I'm sure, on some level because she is so caught up in this dialogue. And you probably feel that you, you can't kind of talk on neutral ground with things that are going on for you. You know, it's hard to trust somebody who's so easily consumed by this obsession and so easily pulled apart by it. And so where it's vulnerable for you is to say, I have to say like, I can't hang with where this is right now. I can't 
feel safe. I don't feel that I can be around this problem that you have, and not because I don't love you. I've loved you for years, but you are changing. Does that make sense? You are not the person who I knew 10 years ago. Or if she is the person and you've changed, where you no longer want to just entertain stories of failure, bad people's failures, then that's part of the dialogue too. Always emphasizing that you love and care for her, but that you don't know what to do with this problem, which isn't that she's not taking your advice. The problem is that you aren't connecting with her anymore. Does that make sense? That's a far more vulnerable place to be in the conversation than offering advice, but it's the only way that she's gonna change. When people realize that their obsessions with their problems are having consequences on their relationships, then it's in their hands to make some choices around it. Does that help? Kind of, but it also opens up a lot of other questions. Uh -huh. <laughs> How do I phrase that? How do I word that? How do I even, you know, yeah. It's, it's I think you can even say, first of all, I clearly care about this because you've brought this up to me, right? I really care about this issue. I've been thinking about how to deal with this. Just showing your concern, right? Just being you. There is no perfect phrase. There's nothing perfect that you can say or do. This conversation is going to suck. <laughs> Just show how much you care and all the thought that you've been putting up into this moment of talking to her and say, and I don't know how to make this conversation happen going forward, but this is what I'm feeling. I want you to know, I don't want to be the friend that runs away from you. And I want to feel more connected to you. And I need some more positivity from you. Or whatever it is, whatever the particularities are. It is going to be a hard, difficult conversation. And that really gets around authenticity. And some of our friendships are more authentic than others. And it's you doing your sort of own inventory. How authentic do I want this relationship to be? And you may decide, I don't want it to be that authentic. But then you do not open yourself up for hearing all of these complaints, because that's only a drain on your energy. Does that make sense? Um, I just wanted to ask, um, when you're speaking to a friend, and a friend sort of in that situation, and, and, bra and can brainstorm action items that uh -huh. they want to do, uh -huh. how do you hold them accountable in uh -huh. a way that's not really, you know, all, you know, in their face, but, you know, you just want them to, to do what they say they'll do? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You tell them to hire a coach. <laughs> Okay, so how do you do that? <laughs> For instance, I have a friend who admits, you know, I have a lot going on, and I think it's more than, you know, my friends can, can handle or my family can handle, and I think I should talk to someone. But then, you, like, it won't happen. It mm -hmm. hasn't happened mm -hmm. forever, you yeah. know? And so how do you hold them accountable for talking to someone or getting a coach or whatever it is? You know, I mean, the thing about friendships, and that's where they are different from work relationships, is we don't often hold each other accountable for things. In fact, what you find bringing is less accountability and more patience. So having patience for your friend that is just struggling with moving on. If it's not deriding from the quality of your relationship, does this make sense? If, in fact, you have a great relationship, your friend just has this one area where they want to improve, you know, meet certain milestones. Listen to them, listen to them, be disappointed that they failed themselves. But you are not, as a friend, the person to hold them accountable for that. Where you can hold someone accountable is if they're behaving in a way that's affecting your relationship to them. And that, if you don't see improvement over time, that's on them. It is never our job as friends to expect to keep people accountable for how they behave. And so sometimes in both of these cases, you just reach your own reckoning around that. Something that you learn as you get older is the value of patience 
that no one does everything they say they're going to do. And then also, secondly, the value of our time and energy in that we can't invest our heart into everybody that we thought we could. So figuring out that balance. It looks like we have time for one more question. Jordan, I'll ask if there's something on the Dory yeah. that you want to read. Yeah. Um, it can be just as difficult to ask for support as it can be to give it. Do you have any thoughts on asking for help in difficult times? Mm -hmm. Anyone who's even thinking about asking for help is like in such a good place. So kudos to whoever asked that question. It's, it's, it's great. I think you want to ask people for help in areas where they're strong. So if your friend is always late, for example, and we all know that person, do not ask them to drive you to court, <laughs> to drive you to your chemo session, <laughs> to meet with your doctor, right? None of the sort of like life <laughs> altering kind of matters. That's just, don't, don't put them under that pressure. But if in fact, they're a really great listener, it's not uncommon for that open kind of person who's sort of fluid with time is also sort of good in the emotional realm. Say, you know, can you just come over tonight? I just need some company. Or you have a friend who's pretty light and bubbly, who may not be very comfortable with awkward, emotionally fraught conversations, but is really good for just escapism. Say, would you watch reality TV with me? Let's go to a movie. Play to people's strengths as aware of them as you are so that you give them an opportunity to give what they know how to give. And don't ask them to give something that's really hard to give. Great. Well, terrific questions and great advice to all of us to think about what we have to give and what others have to give us. And thank you for writing your book and for joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.